Item 4.4, State and Federal Update. Vice Chancellor Marlene Garcia. Good afternoon, Madam President, Chancellor, members of the board. Um, what I'd like to do in this segment is we'll review um, state election results, federal election results, but take a closer look at what some of the particulars are in terms of how it affects the California Community Colleges. What you have before you, you have an election roundup uh, summary document that gives you some of the highlights of key changes in the um, political landscape. And then we've also de developed for you three rosters that include the names of all new um, members and incumbent members for the um, California Assembly, Senate, and for our California Congressional Delegation. So you can use that as your um, cheat sheet to know who, which members are serving which areas and who's new and who's in and who's out. So um, in the sports world, um, sports analysts look at uh, player, uh, player statistics and team statistics as a way to predict mm -hmm. um, outcomes during the course of a season. In the political world or government relations world, we look at election results mm -hmm. and uh, try to predict the performance of the legislature, and in our case, particularly the wealth, the um, economic and policy welfare of the California community colleges. So what I'd like to do, I'd like to first start with reviewing some of the state election outcomes. I won't get into a lot of broad detail because tomorrow you'll be hearing from an expert speaker who will give you the broad political election analysis for the state of California. But instead, what I'll focus on are some of the key developments in the change in landscape that affect our daily business and affect our ability to accomplish the goals that you set out as a board. And then following me, Assistant Vice Chancellor Valerie Purnell will do a similar summary of the federal um, outcomes for California. So um, in the assembly, um, I don't know if you know this, but um, every six year, or every two years, all members of the assembly are required to, to um, pursue reelection. And so you always have a very political dynamic going on. Um, in this case, there were um, 30 new members that have been, that will be um, installed at the um, December 6th organizing legislative session in Sacramento. Um, there are several members, a dynamic that has taken place since um, um, the beginning of term limits, you have members who have moved from house to house. It's a little less common for a member to move from the Senate to the Assembly, but we do have someone this year, Senator um, Gil Cedillo is now going to be a new Assembly member. He has one term left in his term limit sequence. Right. Um, so, he, so he can serve one more term as an assembly member. And we have several members who will move from the assembly to the Senate, and that includes members such as Gene Fuller, um, uh, Tom Berryhill, Ed Hernandez, Noreen Evans, and Doug LaMalfa. So they will be experienced members who move, who move to the second house. The key for us in looking at the change in political landscape is looking at vote counts. And um, we monitor things like, you know, two-thirds vote, particularly in the Senate, when we're, we have um, Board of Governor members up for confirmation, for example. So those are key statistics for us to review. Um, in the Assembly, we now have 54 Democrats. The Assemblies did pick up one seat. They had 53, and we have 38 Republicans. Um, but that does fall just short of the two-thirds vote that the assembly would need to approve any kind of um, tax increase. Um, and I'm gonna talk a moment just briefly about Proposition 25 and Proposition 26, which do affect the dynamics in terms of um, approving a budget for us next year. In the Senate, 20 of the 40 seats were up for re-election. Um, and they alternate year um, every other election. And there are 10 new senators. This is a little more complicated because there are three vacancies still in the Senate. Um, those vacancies occurred as a result of the unfortunate passing of um, Senator Jenny Oropesa and Senator um, Dave Cox. And then also George Runner um, was elected to serve on the Board of Equalization. So technically he hasn't lost his tenants uh, Senate seat, but when he takes office on the Board of Equalization, his seat will become vacant. So that'll be three seats. 
So the magic number for us when we look at the two-thirds vote, as of now, or as of December 6, given those three vacancies, we're going to have 24 Democrats and 13 Republicans. And of course, for confirmations, we need 27 um, votes. Um, once those three vacancies are filled, which could happen in very, very early 2011, some a little earlier than others, we'll probably, and, and those are not competitive seats, so they'll probably fall into the same party's hands. Uh, we'll, we will have 25 Democrats and 15 Republicans. So, um, so those are the figures that may matter to us as we look at legislation and budgets and trailer bills and so forth. Now, in terms of leadership, um, that's, that's a fluid situation. I mean, the election was just last week. We talked to several legislative staffers and, 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 and different members, and things are obviously in transition. Uh, the dust hasn't settled. It's hard to, you know, to know exactly what's going to play out. But this um, governor-elect is meeting with a lot of legislators. He has made it a priority to communicate. And uh, when he was in Sacramento last week getting a briefing on the budget, he did have meetings with the leadership of both houses and um, has apparently placed several phone calls to members. So he's definitely reaching out. Um, in terms of new leadership amongst the legislative um, houses, we have um, Senator Bob Dutton, who just stepped in as minority leader for the Senate. And he's someone who has had a long history with community colleges, so we're hopeful to continue with that relationship and uh, work with him on our priority issues. And then we also have a new member who was just um, who, who just stepped into the role as minority leader in the assembly, and that's Connie Conway. And uh, someone who has, she um, has some friends on this board, and she has been a supporter of community colleges and, and actually served on the assembly higher education committee and has taken a great interest in issues such as student success. So that's who we're dealing with at this point um, in preparing for um, next year's legislative session. Tomorrow I'll give a report on legislative package and talk about the process behind that package, so I won't go into that today. The last two points I'd like to touch on. As yes. a political spouse, um, mm -hmm. Senator Dutton's wife is faculty at a community college. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a friend. Yeah. So the last two things I'd like to mention are the two propositions, several propositions were on the ballot and, and were passed, but two in particular have a direct impact on our budget the approval process of, of the state budget. And of course, one is Prop 25, which um, Chancellor um, Scott um, referred to earlier. And this is the bill that now makes it possible to approve, for the legislature to approve a budget with a major simple majority vote, 50 plus one. So that's gonna be significant in certainly in changing the dynamics of how we deliberate on the budget. And what, what the, the significant difference is the party, the majority party basically can approve a budget without having to rely on the minority party. That's the key distinction as we move forward. It also though means that the majority party will bear the full responsibility of the outcome of that budget. And that's where the, the interplay between Proposition 25 and 26 comes into to play. Proposition 26 was also approved, and what this does is it increases the vote requirement for virtually all tax generate, um, revenue generating um, levers. Taxes have always been a two-thirds vote, but now they've added fees and um, property charges to the mix. So that really limits the hands in terms of being able to generate new revenues to solve a budget. So given the fiscal uh, environment we're in, it's not gonna be easy, even though the majority party will have the votes to adopt, approve the budget um, by June 15th. The constitutional deadline is still going to be a very challenging uh, process. The other component of Prop 25, the, 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 the reducing the budget requirement uh, for approval of the budget is that legislators will no longer get paid or reimbursed for travel or per diem until the budget is passed for every day after June 15th. So that creates an additional incentive for legislators to, to um, 
pass a budget on time. And of course, we're dealing now in new territory. Even though California has been only one of three states in the country that has had the two-thirds vote requirement, um, this shift um, is new for California. And so there are going to be a lot of changing dynamics that, that occur and will, you know, keep you posted on how that develops as we move through the budget process next year. So that about summarizes the state um, election results. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or we can turn to the federal report. Okay, Valerie. Thank you, President Malumed, board members, Chancellor Scott. Glad to be here this afternoon to talk about something that uh, most pundits in the country, if not the world, are talking about. Uh -huh. um, that said, what my intent is this afternoon is to um, first direct your attention to two pieces. There is in your board report uh, the regular federal update that has a November date on it, and there are probably a few things in there. The piece that Marlene just handed out is what I will be speaking from, and the information contained in that basically comes from two sources, our colleagues at AACC in Washington, D.C., as well as a presentation by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and some of the um, most uh, I would say prolific pundits in, in D.C. who were a part of that event as well as uh, longtime 20 year plus veterans in education in Washington, D.C. So those are the things that I, the sources that I will be speaking from. I'll say also that one of the um, challenges in this presentation in having so many people speak about it is that my goal, as well as my style in um, advocating for us, is one that is a nonpartisan one. And so my attempt to be nonpartisan is what I put into the report. I certainly invite you to let me know if I have not achieved that goal, <laughs> because that helps me be a better advocate for all of us. Um, so with all of that, I will say that the 112th Congress is going to look a little different. That's yeah. obvious, that's a major understatement. Um, I have come before you many times to say that it was very clear that the community colleges have enjoyed a kind of attention that has been unprecedented. That certainly was uh, solidified through the first ever White House Summit on Community Colleges that's been referenced here a few times. There's a note on that in the federal report. Um, but given this last election, it will be very interesting to see uh, the changes and how they affect community colleges. I think we are well positioned in that education may be one of the few bridges across uh, both Republican, Democratic, and independent interests. And so while the composition of the House has changed, education is, uh, and particularly community college education, which is so critical to getting people back to work and getting the economy uh, moving again, is going to be uh, an advantage to us. So I don't think that there are any reasons for us to panic immediately. And I see that uh, AACC shares that view, at least for now. It's gonna be a while before we know what the composition of the key committees that we deal with um, will, will be. We are um, going to give you an update on what the final community uh, uh, what the final committee assignments are. Those votes are gonna be taking place within both the Senate and the House the week of November 15th. So after 15th through the 19th is when those votes will take place um, and we will give you an up, uh, up to date um, view of that at the time. Um, but there's a lot of speculation already and many people 
know, uh, who is very likely to win many of the elections. And it's safe to say that increased job attainment and um, job creation is going to be so critical that community colleges are really going to be called on to step up and really be, I would say, aggressive in sharing the message that we are the go-to industry, the go-to entity to train people. And um, in saying that, I think it will be absolutely necessary for us to make sure that we make it clear that we take student success very seriously. Um, the shift in power. Um, clearly, the Republicans are in the majority in the House. Um, the Democrats still in the majority in the Senate, and those minor I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a small uh, margin by which that control is, is held, but nonetheless, it's still there. Um, there's a lot of agreement about what this last election meant. There's some disagreement. I think that disagreement is going to be covered in some areas and through some discussions that we as a country may not be ready to have yet, but I think they're going to be forced anyway. Um, one of the things that I think the implications of this uh, election means is that clearly, as we are pushed to bring about more job training, um, there's going to be uh, a lot of fiscal tightening and an increased call for accountability. What that means for us is that um, we are going to probably increase our, have to increase our reliance on grant funding and public, public sector funding because there will not be the kind of money that has been flowing heretofore. There is not a conversation about a second uh, American uh, uh, AGI, uh, graduation initiative, American graduation initiative, nor is there likely to be any kind of uh, ARA again. I think we are going to be dealing with some something new. Um, one of the things that's going to be very interesting as we see a lot of the um, shift in uh, particularly Congress, we will have uh, folks coming in on the uh, Republican side that may influence shifts in that, um, the way that the party takes care of business. We're going to need to um, make sure that we have many, many friends in both houses. Fortunately, that's been a <coughs> long-term goal, but I think we will be pushing that particular agenda even more so now. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about who some of the key players are, as um, Marlene has, has done. Um, and again, share some of the uh, views of some of our colleagues in Washington, D.C. I think it's interesting that our presumptive Speaker of the House, John Boehner, is the first in his family to go to college, strong supporter of education, particularly Catholic education, and is very knowledgeable about education in general, having um, been through uh, No Child Left Behind. It seems that several of the people who will be taking leadership positions have now had uh, experience with education at the K-12 level, perhaps less so at the higher education level, but that can be um, an advantage in not having to educate people from, from the ground up. Secondly, um, Speaker Pelosi has said that she will be putting her hat in the ring uh, for uh, the leadership position on the Democratic side. I know that um, that is going to be very interesting on the Democratic side or how they uh, begin to work. People have been concerned what about our, our education leadership. George Miller obviously will not be chair, but certainly will be of the um, of the education committee, but certainly will be very uh, a key player in the uh, 
education debates going on. Um, if we look at the possibility of having increased um, favoritism to certain aspects of business, which may mean, for example, this first two years we saw a lot of attention to for-profit education and hearings to look at both the fiscal practices of for-profit educational entities as well as the um, their role, uh, the role of the banking industry in things like direct lending. Um, it is possible that some of those issues will be revisited. There have not been any specific uh, measures about what's going to happen in um, education reform, but the fact that healthcare reform may be opened up in places here and there um, you may remember that education reform was part of that reconciliation um, measure. If that gets opened up, it is possible that we could look at some, see attention again to issues such as direct lending, um, and we just have to wait on that. AACC has said that their major concern is Pell Grant, and I would think that we will probably be there in that same place. Um, and there's not a reason why we wouldn't be. The Pell Grant, uh, maintaining the Pell Grant, both the amount of it and per, uh, the amount of the increased gain through reconciliation is critical and just making sure that Pell Grant stays robust itself. I would imagine that that is where we will see a lot of the advocacy efforts coming forward and sure, certainly we will join in that. Um, the last thing I will say is that uh, it will make sense to look for a couple of things. We're not likely to see any kind of huge major education reform um, that will affect higher education, but there are certain trends that we're going to need to look for, which will be opportunities for us to get in and make our mark and help to maintain the attention that community colleges have enjoyed thus far. I'm absolutely thrilled about hearing hands across community colleges because there are about five major opportunities that I can see in that, that we can really um, take advantage of this, you know, what is it, last two years or who knows? Let's really push that particular agenda. That's a positive thing. But other things for us to look for an opportunity, since they're gonna be limited, major reforms and further fiscal tightening. Again, that means that we're gonna have to look for a lot of grant opportunities. We still have friends in the Department of Education, the Department of Labor. There are existing programs and monies there that are still being distributed and we will need to go for those and I think quite aggressively. Um, we will need to look at non-earmark funding. Our veterans earmark is still in play as of today. However, um, you well know that uh, there is a decision uh, by the Republican Party to place a, a moratorium on earmark funding. Their vote on that issue is supposed to happen on November 16th and within their caucus. Um, but the president has now himself said, okay, let's take a look at earmarking, um, which is a uh, direct in opposite decision of his uh, from his earlier stance on earmark. If it doesn't happen, um, our veterans connect, our vets connect issue. The funding for that goes away. There is a call for uh, using something like an omnibus bill to move through many of the appropriations issues, as opposed to a uh, continuing resolution, for example, which would finish out the lame duck session. Uh, and we would certainly want to see that happen. However, we don't have overall control of that. We can just advocate for what we'd like to see. That particular mechanism, by the way, using a uh, truncated approach to getting legislation or measures through is something we may see more often if, in fact, uh, the Democrats aren't able to get legislation passed, 
They may say, okay, let's use a truncated method like reconciliation that we used before. Or secondly, they may say, let's use uh, a method uh, like regulation, which is something that we've seen an awful lot of in this administration, especially as it deals with higher education. People have said that there's more regulation in higher education in this administration than there has ever been. And um, that may continue if there's gridlock and uh, inability to get legislation through. Uh, finally, uh, increased accountability and uh, a call for increased productivity as we are challenged to create the jobs uh, not create the jobs, I'm sorry, train the people for the new jobs that are being created and being accountable for getting them in and out of those educational programs as well as training programs. And there are going to be lots and lots of adjustments as both parties try to uh, figure out who they are, where they're going to be, how far to the left, how far to the right, um, how many people are going to show up in the center, and that just the logistics of getting lots of new players <coughs> settled in will probably add to a delay which will prevent any major um, education reforms this year. So our goal is to look for opportunities in uh, places that may be unique and not as straightforward as they have been in the past. Thank you for that comprehensive report. Any uh, thoughts or questions? No, thank you. I, I have. There's, uh, I, yes, Member I did, I, Again, I just I want to make sure you, you, you see the, um, and the system sees the opportunities with the new landscape as well. A, a, again, there are going to be a number of new committee chairmen from California. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I, I believe the House uh, uh, Republican whip, Kevin McCarthy, is a former community college trustee, mm -hmm. or he's in line to be a, a, uh, the House Republican whip as well as Jerry uh, Lewis, Lewis, who has been supportive in the past, appropriations. Uh, Buck McKeon, I just looked online. It looks like he's in line to be Armed yes, Services sorry. Committee Chairman. Mm -hmm. And David Dreyer's uh, in line to be the Rules Committee Chairman, mm -hmm. which is one of the most. So I'm hoping that we take this as an opportunity to reconnect with these individuals. And, and my feeling and for what I'm hearing from folks is that the focus is going to be on jobs. And the way you're going to get focus on jobs in addition to whatever economic policies are enacted, is going to be supporting the community colleges. Absolutely. And, and I'm hoping that, uh, that we, we, we aggressively and assertively uh, reach out to these members and uh, continue to carry that message. Couldn't agree more. And um, I'm so looking forward to the trip you and I will take back there to help make that happen. And, uh, uh, and other, that's not uh, to be, that's uh, not meant as a flippant uh, comment, by yeah. the way. I mean, I think it's, it's um, absolutely critical that we do that. There's well, not a way that we're going to be able to um, make a stand as the job creators without actually showing up and saying that we're willing believe, to be that. And I believe we'll be receptive to that message as Buck McKeon was for so long. Mm -hmm. And just uh, the, the trip uh, uh, that all the board members should know about in, in February, there's an annual legislative summit that the uh, Association for Community College Trustees puts on. And scheduled a lot of meetings with uh, legislators and others and would encourage a whole, uh, as many as we can afford to uh, send a delegation to, to Washington, D.C. in February for that conference. Did you want to say something? No. Nope. Oh, no, well, thank you. It's good for us to be Not thinking sure. about Washington. Um, if I don't hear any objection, I was going to take a 10-minute break and then come back. Is that okay? Okay, we're ready to begin our session. Members, please take their seat. Oh, thank you, Member Baca. Okay, we are going to do, thank you, item 4.5, presentation on the El Camino College Mathematics, Engineering, Science, Achievement Program. Vice Chancellor Barry Russell. Thank you, President Malumet and Board of Governors. Um, 
visiting a campus, we always like to feature one of the, uh, the great student success pro, one of the great student success programs on the campus. And um, so uh, on this campus, we have a MESA program. Um, the uh, state has uh, 33 MESA programs in community colleges. 30 of them are funded, three of them are self-funded. Um, and the MESA program actually crosses all segments of higher education and K-12. So there, there are MESA, MESA programs throughout the UC, CSU, the independents, K through 12. There are also uh, seven other states that have patterned uh, MESA programs after the California model, which actually had its beginnings um, like most uh, things in the 60s in Berkeley. Um, <laughs> and uh, so th the MESA program has been around for quite a while um, and uh, uh, at the state level. And so we wanted to focus in on the one here on campus. And I have the uh, Vice President of Academic Affairs, Francisco Arce, uh, here, as well as the director of the MESA program, Arturo Hernandez, uh, to give the presentation. Well, good afternoon and welcome to all Camino College. I hope as you're having a great time here, although it is business, uh, we certainly hope that you're enjoying uh, your time here. Okay, um, today we're gonna give you a brief overview <coughs> of the El Camino College MESA program and the support services to our STEM students. So I'll start by giving you a description of what the MESA program itself is about. MESA extends academic support, enrichment opportunities, financial resources to historically underrepresented financially and educationally disadvantaged students who intend to transfer to four-year universities under a calculus-based degree. The goal of the program is to increase the, the pool of STEM graduates uh, excuse me, the, the pool of STEM graduates to meet the needs of the technical workforce uh, so much needed in the U.S. Now we're gonna move to the next uh, slide. Uh, who is a MESA student? MESA students are required to, uh, the to have a declared major in the college, uh, uh, the core mother science based degree at the college. They're required to be at the intermediate algeb uh, algebra um, courses. They are required to have financial aid and be educationally disadvantaged. Now, not every STEM student is eligible for the MESA program. For that reason, we actually created what we call our ASEM program. ASEM is just MESA backwards, and it stands for Achieving in Science, Engineering, and Mathematics. Um, as long as the students are uh, pursuing a calculus-based degree and planning to transfer to a four-year university, they are eligible to participate in, in our program. I would like to say that with the ASEM program, we are able to extend our services to other STEM students and it helps us to keep track of, of, of their academics. It helps us to, uh, to uh, collect data. And at the same time, it helps us to make a stronger case when we go out there and pursue uh, grand uh, opportunities as you will see throughout the presentation today. Now, who are our MESA SM students? Uh, we currently have 385 students in the program. As we can see here, about, a, about half of the students are low income and first generation who are uh, actually our MESA students. About, about nearly a third of the students meet the low income or first generation that are actually, those are actually students who um, are, we are able to serve through our new funded uh, TRIO STEM program. The TRIO STEM program requires low income and first generation, but it gives us some flexibility in terms of the low income or first generation as, as well. And about um, what, what you see also on the chart, the 89 students in our program Actually, it's about a quarter of the students who are outside of the target groups that we are serving. Now, the MESA Community College MESA programs require the implementation of 13 components. Today, we're gonna review the six uh, critical components. Due to time restrictions, we're not gonna be able to go through the entire 13 components. I feel that the most important components is what you see on this slide. The administrative component is a, a required full-time program director. Uh, for the MESA program, and the following uh, five um, components will be reviewed today. Uh, just for your view, these are the additional seven components uh, that comprise a, a MESA program. Now let's move on to the next slide, which is the MESA SM Study Center. The MESA Center is a dedicated space, space for MESA SM students to study and network among with other students who are taking similar, similar courses 
or have similar majors really provides a sense of identity uh, to, to our students. Some of the services provided in the Mesa Center are academic counseling, tutoring services, book loans, calculator loans. The Mesa Center is open over 60 hours a week, Monday to Saturday. As you can see, uh, during the spring semester, we actually had an average of 170 visitors every day. Each student spent an average of two hours. The Mesa Center is really impacted. We actually have 2,000 square feet of space and it is crowded every day. Another component, another critical component of our program are student support services. Uh, in coordination with the Career and Transfer Center, we develop activities to educate, prepare students in the transfer process. Last semester, we had approximately 30 students from our Mesa ASM program participated in a four uh, in a four-day Northern California tour. Our students visited UC Berkeley, UC Davis, UC Santa Cruz, UC Merced, and Santa Clara University. For many of our students, this is the first time they actually step outside of the communities where they live. So in reality, it is really an eye-opening experience for many of our students. Another critical component is the academic excellence workshops. The AEW model is the one that was first founded by UC Berkeley professor Yuri Trisman. Our ECC students are actually what we call our MESA facilitators. They actually communicate with the instructors on a weekly basis so they can pre prepare material, uh, materials in the core math and science courses. So when the students come into the sessions, they have additional practice problems, and also they get the opportunity to clarify those concepts that may not be fully covered during a lecture because, because of time constraints. The students that come to their regularly to the MESA workshops, they're actually uh, eligible to get a stipend from the, from the program by uh, getting a B or, 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 or a better grade in, in, in the course. Another important component is the academic uh, counseling. Uh, we currently have a half-time STEM counselor in the MESA Center for our MESA ASM students. The students are required to have a two-year academic plan in their files. It gives them the opportunity and the responsibility to take ownership in their academic progress. At the same time, they're making sure they're taking the classes that they need to transfer for the universities of, of, of choice. Professional development is definitely critical. Uh, we do this through, uh, through providing sponsorship of local and national conferences in engineering and science majors. Uh, it provides the students the opportunity to see themselves as professionals while interacting with scientists and engineers. Um, this is another example where our students get to participate in local or national conferences, and oftentimes it's the first time that they're actually outside of California. Again, these are great opportunities for our students uh, through professional development. They get to uh, meet mentors. They get to network with other students across the United States. Um, this is what I consider one of the most valuable experiences for our students, summer research opportunities. This is usually done when students are at the four-year universities, but here at the El Camino College uh, program, we actually prepare well our students so they can actually conduct research at four-year institutions and other research uh, 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 institutions as well. Cool. Some of those uh, facilities have been at uh, UCLA, Stanford, JPL, Kennedy Space Center, among other, um, among other places. Uh, what we see on this picture uh, is uh, one of our MESA students who actually just transferred to uh, UC Berkeley. His name is Michael Shodilla. He's conducting research at Ohio State University in the biochemistry-related field. Michael Shodilla was also the presidential award for the Natural Science Division and the recipient of several scholarships at El Camino College. Here we have another example of the enrichment opportunities that our students get to participate in. Uh, in this picture, you see uh, three of our students uh, who actually were selected among 200 other 50 students across the nation. Uh, they actually participated in a competition where they uh, were uh, required to develop uh, a project for a mission to Mars. They actually uh, developed a program budget in Thailand for, for launching a, a, a project. Uh, the students were uh, able to attend um, different sites, different NASA sites. Uh, two of them are in the uh, Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, and the other one um, is uh, Marshall Space Flight Center in Birmingham, Alabama. 
the student just came out last week from that uh, three-day experience. Scholarships are always a, way so, a, a, way, a great way to support our students' education. Uh, last semester, we had 73 MESA students uh, awarded the National Science Foundation scholarships. Seven acro across California, seven of those scholarships were awarded to El Camino College students. That represents twice as many awards as any other colleges have received. Over the years, here at El Camino, 38 of our students of our MESA students have been recipients of the MESA NSF scholarships with an average amount of $11,500 each. Again, that's just from the National Science Foundation. Other scholarship opportunities are given through the El Camino College Foundation to industry supporters and, and private supporters as, are, are, as well. Uh, what we see on this picture is uh, our spring 2010 um, MESA dinner where we recognize many of our students who receive scholarship awards uh, about 52 of our students were awarded scholarships uh, ranging between $250 to $12,500 each. Again, this is just during the spring semester. Now let's take a quick snapshot of the uh, gender uh, breakdown at El Camino College versus uh, our MESA program. I think what this picture tells us is that still science and engineering is still dominated by, by, by males. Uh, the ethnic breakdown of the El Camino College population versus the MESA ASIN program. I believe this is an interesting picture. As we can see at El, with the El Camino College population, about 52% are African American and Latino, while in the MESA ASIN program, it is actually 57%, which actually reflects the mission of the MESA program to increase the number of students who, ha who are uh, from uh, economically disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, now let's look at our transfer um, numbers. Uh, 446 students have been uh, transferring since, uh, two th since 1999, which is when the program was established at El Camino College. I believe what the picture tells us here is that our, the school of choice for our students is the, is the, the, the UC. They're well positioned to get into the schools that they want. Usually the problem that they have is deciding between going to UCLA UC Berkeley or UCLA and USC. Our students are very competitive wherever they go. Now we're talking about the success of all our students, uh, but the reality is many of them come at the intermediate algebra level or below. We work with the students across their path, towards calculus, they're persistent, we encourage them, we have a number of resources, we help them to actually uh, you know, achieve their, their, their goals. Um, 60% are the students that come at the uh, pre-algebra level, I'm sorry, um, intermediate algebra level or below. Uh, I would like to know that intermediate algebra is just one course below transfer level math. 18% um, of the students when they come to El Camino are the trigonometry pre-calculus levels, and 18% are at the uh, coming into the calculus series, 16% of them being calculus one and, and two. Now, um, this is some of the results, as you can see, um, over the past 10 years, the school of choice of our students are UCLA, Cal State Long Beach, UC Berkeley, Irvine, Cal Poly Pomona, and San Diego. I think the note that I would like to highlight here is our students tend to stay in the local communities for that reason that we have the highest numbers to uh, UCLA and, and Cal State Long Beach. Our transfer measures. Biology is one of the most popular measures, as we can see followed by mechanical and electrical engineering, and then computer science. I would like to highlight that in this picture we see mechanical and electrical engineering are separated, but if we look at the overall spectrum of the engineering fields, 168 students in our program are actually pursuing, uh, act, actually transferred into the engineering fields. Um, here we see a picture of our transfer uh, dinner from last semester. Uh, this was the largest cohort ever. Uh, I'm trying to look the right slide here, one second. Uh, 35 of the students transferred into the sciences, while 27 per of them transferred into the engineering um, fields. Now, um, the MESA ASIN support system, financial resources. Our MESA program is supported by the state. MESA receives funding from the chancellor's office. The allocation for the 2010-11 academic year is 50,500 which comes from fund for student success. The uh, college, the program is also supported by the El Camino College, of course. 
Um, other federal support is coming from grants from the Department of Education, such as the STEM grant that we received two years ago, and, and most recently, the new STEM uh, trio program. We actually were awarded $220,000 per year for up to five years, and this is a renewable grant. Private donations to the ECC Foundation from industry partners and private uh, supporters are also uh, part of the uh, funds that come to, to El Camino College. Our, our foundation does a great job selling the program, putting the word out there, out there and oftentimes we have industry coming and uh, giving us money uh, uh, to, to, to the college because of the work that we do with our students. I'd like to make a note that while the state funding will not support the MESA program entirely, it is the state allocation that allows MESA to leverage additional resources. Without the state allocation, we will be limited in our ability to leverage the additional resources that we have received at this point. I'd like to thank Chancellor Scott and the Board of Governors for the continued support. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Barry Russell and Dr. Eric Skinner for the support at the Chancellor's Office. I'd also like to say that I'm very fortunate to be at El Camino College. We have great support from all the different levels. Dr. Fallo, our Vice President, Dr. Francisco Arce, and my supervising this, Dr. Don Goldberg and Dr. Jean Sheng Wilder. We work together as a unit, and I believe that's the reason that we have been successful. I certainly hope that you feel the same way. I'd like to take this moment to highlight our MESA newsletter. So this is where you see the success of our uh, past academic year. Particularly, I'd like you to take a look at page uh, two and three. There you will see the transfer students, where they're going and their majors. Page uh, four and five, you will see uh, scholarship awards. Page uh, six and seven, uh, you will see academic awards. And page uh, eight and nine, you will see student research profiles. I'd like to close by letting you know that our students are well prepared to conduct research at any four-year institutions across the U.S. They are well prepared to transfer to their schools of choice. Uh, I'd like to open up for any questions. And, and I would just like to comment on Arturo and his program, it's our program. Every, every program like this that is a, as successful as the MESA program is at El Camino College, of course, is tied together by the dedication of staff like Arturo. He's worked diligently and very, very hard, along with uh, Dean Shankweiler and Dean Goldberg, who are in, in the audience. Uh, you know, we're very proud of this program. And, and this program ties together all of the ingredients that we've been talking about all day in terms of student success, in terms of the kind of support that students from lower income or disadvantaged backgrounds or community college students in, in general uh, need. They need counseling, they need direct attention, they need tutoring, peer tutoring, a place that's safe for them to go and study and get all of the support that they need. And the photographs really don't do the program justice in the sense that you go to the Mesa Center and you will find a couple of dozen students all the time helping each other. And it's students helping each other that makes this program as successful as it is. And then of course you have the, the peer tutors and the people that are tuto has trained, but it's his dedication to this program certainly that, is, that has made it such a success. Uh, we, we've been very fortunate because it really has become a model for what we have to do in order to increase student success at El Camino. And uh, we've actually also been very fortunate this year because in addition to what we're doing in the MESA program, uh, we've been successful through our tutor and, and the dean's efforts uh, to uh, uh, garner a, a federal trio grant that uh, gives the program about $220,000 a year for five years, and the grant is renewable. In addition to that, we just uh, recently uh, were informed that we were awarded uh, a uh, STEM grant 
in the amount of uh, $3.2 million for five years. And in addition to that, uh, President Palo has committed $2.5 million from the Measure E program to build a new STEM center in a building that we're vacating. So we have uh, a lot of activity going on at El Camino College, and it really uh, has uh, been jump-started by the wonderful work that has been done in this program. We have many programs, of course, that are successful, but this program really stands out as a model of what we have to do in community colleges in order to have successful students. Our students need a lot of help. They need a place to go where they're gonna get that help, and they can help each other, which is really what makes this program so wonderful because the students help each other and you see them there working on the computers, their books, their notes, and they're there all the time, which is really, to me, it's, it's a great example of what we do really well. Thank you. And if you have questions. Well, thank you, you both. That's a great program for you to highlight. Thank you. Okay. Any questions or comments from my board members? Member Baca? Yeah, I want to congratulate you on the work that you've done. I think that the NSF scholarship numbers are, are certainly reflective of your, your, um, your very good work. This has been around for, for, for a while, but here for the past 11 years. And um, the question that I have is, have you been able to do a little bit of follow-up with maybe those students that have left the uh, El Camino, gone on to Berkeley and these other colleges, and then maybe gone into graduate school? How, do you continue to have that contact with those students? We, uh, we have tried to do that, although it is difficult. A lot of times the students don't keep their emails or their phone numbers. We do some of that, but it is uh, at, the, at the very minimal level. So uh, one of the efforts that we're working with the chancellor's office is establishing a MIS database where we, where we will be able to keep track of the students even though after the transfer, maybe after they become professionals to see what is the income level and things like that. So that is the project underway under the chancellor's office. Yeah, because it would seem to me that drawing them back in into the college would be a really motivating mm -hmm. type of thing to do as we you know, recognize in, in our work and particularly these focused programs that are geared toward a particular population. Yeah, in, in our case, I feel that we're really fortunate. Um, on our backyard, as you know, we have Northrop Grumman, Raytheon. A lot of our students are already working in the community, and they actually come and become mentors of our former, our, of our current students in, in the program. <laughs> uh, I'd like to just make a note. Uh, you know, we're always looking for opportunities for our students. We work very closely with the grants office and the foundation, and um, we hope that we get um, a grant that we apply for NSF uh, STEM. This is a scholarship that awards our students for a period of five years, the total amount is $600,000. So again, we're always very active. As Dr. Arce said, we work together to make sure that we bring as many resources as possible. And definitely the financial resource uh, through the NSF, uh, to the support of NSF or other agencies is really critical for our students. So thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Sure. Thank you and uh, if you didn't get a chance to look through this uh, brochure, it's, it's really a wonderful example also of the kind of information that we use to also garner more support mm -hmm. from, from corporations and the public. So thank you very much for, for having us today. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, we're yeah, I'm sorry. I was just going to extend my congratulations as well as the other board members. I think you should feel so very good about what you do. It's just an outstanding program. But my specific question was uh, the numbers of students that are enrolled in the program and the operating budget that exists for the program. What are those two numbers? The students that, we're, that we have been serving through the MESA program uh, Technically, we're supposed to serve about 100 students. 100 students? 100 students with the MESA program itself. Because of the infrastructure that El Camino has provided, we're actually serving 330, 385 students, as you may have seen in some of the slides. The additional support services come uh, additional funding from the college, from industry, and also through the STEM grant, to other STEM grant that we have received in the past. This is the first year that we actually have an operating budget of $370,000, including the uh, the, the dollars that come from the Trio STEM program. Uh, I missed, what was the number again? I missed well, that. Uh, $370,000. $370, this is the, the first year that we have. But we, just start, we just started that grant. So that is correct. $220,000 a year from the federal government. 
220 from the federal government. Right, this year, just started. Uh, uh, just started. But what, up until what was the budget then, prior to that time? It's been, what, about 100,000, 120,000? That's correct. Yes. Plus his yeah. salary, which the college That's has absorbed. Plus his salary on top yes. of that. Mm -hmm. Right. Member Perez. Just a point of clarification. The 170 um, students that visit per day and the 195 tutors, those are just this campus? Yeah. Just, uh, just in the Mesa Center here right. at the Camino That's College. That's very impressive. By itself. Mm -hmm. Very impressive. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, thank you very much well, for taking you. the time and sharing it. All right. Thank you for your time. Thanks very impressive. Um, yeah. Just to yeah. orient impressive the board a little yes. bit, we're yeah. going to sure. show the veterans video that I believe was online. Um, and Terry, if you wanted to come up and just say a few words. Um, the Chancellor will. And then uh, we'll have our public forum. Um, it says new business, but I'm not expecting too much. And then at 5 o'clock, we go into a closed session. Um, and that will be in a room behind this door here. So just wanted people to know. Uh, well, I just uh, wanted to add a few words about uh, the whole veterans program. I mentioned some things this morning, uh, but uh, I mentioned briefly about three of our colleges who received grants from the U.S. Department of Education to develop centers of excellence for veteran student services. Uh, that's nearly $400,000. Uh, we also partnered with a high-tech center training unit at De Anza College. And uh, we are, as you know, we had a wonderful committee here, the Veterans Committee, uh, involving Bobby McDonald and Manuel Baca of our board on how California Community College <coughs> are helping student veterans successfully integrate back into student life. Also, I'll just tell you that we're working hard on continuing that $500,000 earmark that I think I was brought up uh, uh, to you by Valerie Purnell. And uh, we now are going to show this video which talks about services to veterans and it was recently prepared for posting on the White House Summit website. It helps put a face on the student veterans in our system and highlights a few of the significant efforts our student veterans. It has a telephone interview with community college alumni Jeremy Renner uh, who started the movie The Hurt Locker and highlights two other former community college students, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger and actor Clint Eastwood. So anyway, I want to uh, express my appreciation to Vice Chancellor Dick Carball, who continues to do a great work as our Vice Chancellor of Communications. And so uh, with those words, Terry, I'll turn it over to you. I think Jack pretty much summed up the, the video, but it was a pleasure to make it. Uh, it is a board priority, so it sort of flows from board priorities. It also really helped us put a face on our system uh, at the national level. Um, as you know, veterans are very moving, very important, uh, and heroic. And I think, uh, losing my... Th throughout the, um, the White House Summit, uh, veterans played uh, a tremendous role and it was a, um, a major thing. So with that, we'll go ahead and show the film. Shunker tells a familiar story, a story about a war veteran back home trying to fit in. It's pretty weird to go from, you know, going after the most wanted in Baghdad to sitting in a classroom. The 22-year-old Yunker was Army, Airborne Infantry, Reconnaissance. His days were spent hunting war criminals. Today, quest to college on California's Central Coast is the backdrop for the next phase of his life and the challenges here seem just as daunting. And it's hard to um, relate sometimes with the students, you know. This is the first thing they've really done with their life is go to college and, and as veterans we're kind of coming back into that after doing something that was, you know, huge, I guess. 
The feelings of inadequacy are often preceded by depression, insomnia, and wartime flashbacks. It's called post-traumatic stress disorder. You're largely alone. David Curry failed at his first try at community college, but a second tour in Iraq changed him. He came home determined not to become another wartime statistic. It's scary, and you have to develop your own uh, organizational structure of how to run your life because there's not this big entity helping you do that. More and more schools are now training their teachers and counselors to recognize the needs of veterans. At Sierra College in Northern California, Catherine Morris began her work with vets and teachers not long after the 9-11 attacks. We look at it, you know what, you went through some pretty horrendous things and you have some trauma about it, which any human being you know, on this earth would have. That doesn't make you weak, that doesn't make you have an illness. That just means you've been through a lot and we're here to help. At two million, California has one of the largest vet populations in America. During the 2008-2009 school year, almost 22,000 students used military education benefits to go back to school, and an estimated 80% turned to community colleges. All right, guys. At Saddleback College in Southern California, veterans receive priority registration, but there's a special focus on math and English. Our recent study showed that 98% of our student veterans initially placed in below college level math and 64% placed in below college level English. Almost 3 million students attend California's 112 community colleges and there's an impressive group of alumni. I uh, went to Santa Monica College to learn English. Not that it is perfect, may I remind you, <laughs> but nevertheless it did help. Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger jokes, but his success is unquestioned. Clint Eastwood attended community college, as did rising Hollywood star Jeremy Renner. I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die comfortable. Renner's portrayal of an Iraq war soldier in the Hurt Locker touches a nerve with today's vets. Renner talked about his days at Modesto Junior College from the set of the new Mission Impossible movie in Prague. My experiences in college were, were amazing. I, I learned so many things that I take with me now to this very moment. And then, you know, an amazing <clears throat> job I, that I love uh, doing every day. It's what I'm doing here in Prague. With more vets coming home from war, the number of men and women returning to college in California is expected to top 34,000 by the end of 2010. And the majority of them will attend community college. At the foot of the San Gabriel Mountains, just outside Los Angeles, Citrus College sits as one of America's most vet-friendly schools. GI Jobs Magazine selected Citrus from a pool of 7,000 colleges and universities. Here they pioneered a program called Boots to Books, veterans teaching veterans how to succeed in a world without war. It's veterans who have been where they have been. And uh, whether they were in a, a war environment or not, it's understanding that they are a different type of student. You know where I've been, you know what it's about, where other people may not get me. A growing number of California community colleges are opening vet centers. What's a pro crowd so? David Keyes tutors his fellow vets here. But this is a place to go on those days when they can't escape the memories of war. We study together and we hang out together and it makes the whole transition back into school a lot, a lot easier, like you don't feel so out of place. The memories and the experiences bond them and separate them from the rest of the world. We also have a scholarship board. For 15 years, Ann Reeder struggled with drug and alcohol addictions, but she found acceptance among vets at community college. Society expects us to come back and jump into our roles as women, and um, we don't get an opportunity to be recognized as we serve too. We have some of the same issues, some of our same psyche, emotional and mental, and we need to kind of debrief too. The new GI Bill offers amazing opportunities, but the application process can be complicated and confusing. For Citrus, it's $2,052. You get 70% of that. Fill out the wrong paperwork, and a vet loses money. That's why many of these campus centers now come with a financial aid counselor dedicated solely to vet applications. So we work as a team, I certify, they get paid, we're happy, we're all happy. For some, it's a longer road than others. Lance Junker suffered serious injuries in Iraq. He spent a year in recovery and doctors told him he might not walk again. 
When we did the student teach. Yunker is not only walking, he's serving as an ambassador for veterans. He was one of the first to take part in Governor Schwarzenegger's Operation Welcome Home, and today he is the face of the California Initiative. I feel like a lot of the guys I served with and, and that come back um, have trouble communicating what they went through, and I feel like I'm still serving. I feel like I'm uh, not only giving back to veterans, but um, I'm kind of on the front lines. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So, uh, so this was very well received both in Washington and here in California. Um, soon after we posted it, Sergeant Unker got multiple calls from the White House uh, congratulating him, and he also got a call um, from Governor Schwarzenegger. So the, the video was well received and, and widely watched. Um, and then just on, kind of on another interesting note, we did um, shoot that and wrap it in about a week and a half. So we moved pretty promptly. The White House Summit was announced really just a couple of weeks before they held it. And, um, and the producer that I hired, his name is John Lobertini, and he's a Fox 40 newsman. And I told him, I said, John, three minutes, three minute video, that's it, that's it. He was so in love with his subject. A skilled and trained newsman could not stay within that boundary. So he came back, he said, there's too much to say, we have to go with six. <laughs> so anyway, I leave you on that. But it was a joy to do it. It was well received across the country and, and um, in our state as well. well yes, thank you. <laughs> we'll move on to the public forum part of our session. <coughs> we have one speaker, Nahasi Ronald Lee from the <coughs> Student uh, Educational Center of Compton. Good afternoon. My name is Nahasi Ronald Lee. I'm a student at the Compton Community Educational Center. I'm also the Region 7 representative to the Student Center of California Community Colleges, which means that uh, El Camino is uh, one of the colleges in my uh, purview, along with Santa Monica College and 12 others, the Compton Community Educational Center being one. Uh, I provided you with a couple of items. Normally when I come to this table, I generally have too many things to say in the time allotted, so I just bur I just breathed through it. Uh, one, of this, one of these is this uh, Santa Monica College newspaper that is uh, actually intended to draw uh, Chancellor Scott's attention to the story in the upper left hand corner. I, didn't re I thought my constituency was more, m normally uh, students 18 to 25, except these uh, students referred to in this uh, article are 65 and older. They've been impacted by the fact that the, uh, uh, the, the cost of classes that they were getting free has uh, uh, been imposed upon them and they uh, rose quite its due. Uh, I was going to try and have them here, but I decided I had other important things to do uh, for public comment. Uh, the other item I provided is this. Uh, this is provided because I've never seen this woman, and as a student at the Compton Community Educational Center, I want you to know that I'm severely impacted by the personal proclivities of Ms. Barbara Bino. Uh, we accept and understand the role and responsibilities of the ACCJC, but this woman has imposed herself in this uh, in this. Uh, discourse in a manner that is uh, confusing the partnership, AB, 7, AB 318 and the like. And if, I don't know what she looks like, so if anybody knows her, if she's in the room, could you point her out to me so I'll know who she is from now on. Uh, the main purpose I'm here is because there's a controversy at the Compton Community, Community Educational Center in regards to the extension of the contract for the CEO, Dr. Lawrence Cox. Uh, normally I try to find out uh, when I get into an organization, I try to find out who's who and what's what. I like reading uh, uh, organizational charts. So I always understand that the Board of Governors hired Mr. Scott 
Uh, I'm here to implore the Board of Governors to implore Dr. Scott to direct Dr. Peter Landsberger to extend the, con the contract of uh, Dr. Lawrence Cox. And I know I can do that because in AB 318, it says existing law authorizes the chancellor on one page. It says the bill would uh, authorize the chancellor to assume and delegate to the special trustee. It says the bill would authorize the chancellor to oversee all actions at the com community uh, college district. Uh, in another area, it says uh, the special trustee is, is to appoint an advisory committee to advise the special trustee with respect to the management of the Compton Community College District. The problem is that for the last year and a half, the special trustee has not appointed an advisory committee. If the special trustee had appointed an advisory committee, he'd be receiving input in regards to the community's concern and desire to have Dr. Lawrence Cox, who now serves as a role model for young African-American male students and the community. Uh, yes, Mr. Lee, if you yes. could wrap up, please. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, the community hopes that uh, the chancellor can direct the special trustee to uh, adhere to the wishes and desires of the community, which is to have Dr. Lawrence Cox extended as a uh, CEO of the Compton Community College District. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any new business? Seeing none, I think we will adjourn and the Board of Governors will adjourn to a room behind us for our closed session.